Good morning. It is so good to have each and every one of you here with us this morning as we continue in our study of Second Kings. So if you have your Bible handy, uh, why don't you just take it and open it up to Second Kings chapter 17. We'll be starting in verse number one in just a moment. First, we want to open with a word of prayer. Uh, I am just leading you in prayer and Wherever you may be at this moment in time, uh, you can lift up your heart to the Lord in prayer from where you are and, and pray the prayer that you need to pray to God this morning. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we praise you. We thank you, Lord, for this day that you've given each one of us. Lord, we, we thank you for the honor and the privilege that we have to be able to do what we're doing now, to be able to open your word, to freely and openly uh, discuss it and to put forward the things that the that God's word says to us, uh, no matter whether they agree with our political views or our, our social views or not, Lord, we are able to speak of that which is in the Bible freely and openly. Lord, guide our hearts as we do this. Lord, help us to understand how we take these timeless principles and apply them in our lives today. Lord, we pray for those that, whom we know who are sick and ill and need healing. Lord, we know that all healing comes from you, whether that be physical or emotional or psychological or, or even something that is between us and a friend. Lord, we, we ask that you would help us in, in, in bringing healing in those situations, and that you would heal in the ways that only you can do. Lord, guide our hearts now. It's in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, that we pray. Amen. Let's start out by looking at a map and kind of catching up on what we looked at last week. As we looked at this map last week, and in, in 2 Kings chapter 17, verses 1 through 3, we read, In the twelfth year of Ahaz, king of Judah, which would be 732 B.C., Hoshea, Hoshea is a better way to pronounce it, Hoshea, the son of Elah, became king of Israel in Samaria, and he reigned nine years. And he did evil in the sight of the Lord, but not as the kings of Israel who were before him. Shalmaneser, king of Assyria, came up against him, and Hoshea, being the, his vassal, became his vassal and paid him tribute money. Now looking at the map here, in, in verse number two, it tells us that the new king of Israel, Hoshea, and, and on our map, we see Israel right here, okay? And he becomes king of Israel, and, and Israel's capital is in Samaria, which is right here, okay? And Hoshea continued to lead the people of the ten northern tribes of Israel to worship the idols of the Canaanites and the surrounding regions. And that's what is meant when it says in verse 2 that he did evil in the sight of the Lord. But it goes on to say that not as the kings of Israel who were before him. Now this likely means and says not as he was not like Jeroboam. And all the kings of Israel before Hoshea, worshiping the golden calves in Bethel and Dan, which Jeroboam had placed there. And this is only because those areas of Israel had been conquered by Tiglath-Pileser, and he had taken these areas down through central Israel, uh, beginning up here with in the area of Dan and coming all the way past the Sea of Galilee. He took all of Galilee. Then he 
made a, a left turn and went into Gilead and, and captured all of the, the areas of Israel that were on the east side of the Jordan River. So the size of Israel was reduced dramatically to what we see in purple on this map. And that's the reason Samaria is much further north in the total land of Israel because of that work of Tiglath-Pileser as he came in and took those regions. Uh, he did that in 734 through 732 BC. We go back to 2 Kings 15 and look at verse 29. We read, in the days of, of Pekah, king of Israel, Tiglath-Pileser, king of Assyria, came and took Ejon, abel beth Maaka, Janoa, Kedesh, Hatzor, Gilead, and Galilee, and all the land of Naphtali. And so when he had come in in that time period, and, and he, had, he had come in from the north, and he had gone through and, ca and captured all these, these lands down in this region. So he, he had captured everything except for what was in this purple area. And in fact, he was even controlling the, the pass through the mountains at, at, at uh, Megiddo that allowed him to go on down into Philistia and have a free path for his armies all the way to Egypt. So let's now, let's go to uh, 2 Kings 17, uh, verses 4 through 7. Now, before I do that, I want to say that Tiglath-Pileser III died in 727 B.C., and he was succeeded as the king of Assyria by his son, Shalmaneser V. Now, what we see here is Hosea had, Hos, Hoshea had, had tried to, well, well, we're going to talk about this in just a minute, but Shalmaneser sent a general with a, a much smaller army than Tiglath-Pileser had came into, come into Israel with, and he went over to the capital city of Samaria. And, and he came up against the capital as if he's going to fight them, and Hoshea went ahead and became his vassal and paid him tribute money, and he went away. So now we come to chapter 17, beginning in verse 4. Four, and we read, the king of Assyria uncovered a conspiracy by Hoshea, for he had sent messengers to So, king of Egypt, and brought no tribute to the king of Assyria as he had done year by year. Therefore, the king of Assyria shut him up and bound him in prison. Okay, in other words, he took him, he captured Hoshea the king of Israel, and put him in prison. And now the king of Assyria went throughout all the land and came up to Samaria and besieged it for three years. And that three years was 724 through 722 B.C. Now let's come down and let's look at these verses in a little more detail and I'll explain some of these historical things to you. Uh, let me go back here first. Okay, in verse 4 here, the king of Assyria uncovered a conspiracy by Hoshea. Instead, we see here it explained that instead of paying his annual tribute owed as a vassal of Assyria, Hoshea sent messengers to So, S-O, king of Egypt. Now, we know from Egyptian records that there was a king that was spelled O-S-O-R-K-O-N. And in Hebrew, the people of Israel just called him So, okay? His, his name, he was Osorkan the fourth. And the Egyptian records tell us that he did in fact reign between 727 and 716 BC. So that is right in this window, okay? And, and, Hoshea tried to make a covenant or an alliance with Egypt 
and combine their armies against the king of Assyria. Now this alliance by Hoshea was, was foolish from, from many standpoints, but most of all for the nation of Israel, it, it was because this was against God's will. In Deuteronomy 7-2, when the people of Israel were just about to cross the Jordan River into their promised land, God, through Moses, told the people of Israel that to make such alliances with pagan rulers was not allowed. That was not God's will. They were to rely upon God for protection of their borders. Now, Shalmaneser V responded to this conspiracy by Hoshea by bringing a massive Assyrian army. It tells us that he quickly went throughout all the land. Now, what that means is he conquered the remaining land of Israel all around the capital city of Samaria. And he and he ca even captured King Hoshea and took him back to Assyria. And then he placed the capital city, Samaria, under siege. Now, Sir Samaria had fresh water supply there in the capital city. They had stored up a lot of food. And so they were able to hold off in this siege for three years. In verse 5, we see that the reason that Shalmaneser V was vaguely referred to as just the king of Assyria is when we go back and look at Assyrian secular records, we see that Shalmaneser V died and his son, Sargon II, just picked up the siege right where it was and he carried it through to its conclusion in 722 B.C. Okay, now, I want to show you this map and talk to you a little bit about verse number six that we just read. Okay, this is a, a map of Assyria. And the, the entire Assyrian Empire, you can see that they it shows them as having uh, control over all of Palestine and all the way down and all the way through Egypt. Okay, eventually they would have that kind of control. But what we see in verse 6 is that in 722 B.C., after Assyria had taken control of Samaria, the capital city of Israel, it says that they carried Israel away to Assyria. So they brought the people of Israel back to Assyria, this area up here primarily. OK, it also gives us some specifics about what what they brought, where, where they brought them to. Now, we know from Israel's history that Israel tells us that what they did is they did a hideous thing to the people that they conquered, that they took all of their young men and boys and they took them into captivity into Assyria and made them slaves. OK leaving behind the women and the chill and the very small children and only the old very old men who were not able to sire children okay we also see here that they took them by the river of gozan which is a major tributary in the northern headwaters of the euphrates river and on our map we see Gozan, right up in this area, and we see the Harbor River, which it refers to right here. See, here's Gozan on this map. Also, there they have uh, archaeologists have found a, a tell near Gozan called Halaf, H-A-L-A-F, and this is the ruins of ancient Gozan. It sets right on the a, a, a branch of the Harbor River, just like it says here in verse 6. And this is the area and the place where a large number of these, of these Israeli men 
were taken. But it also tells us in verse 6, there was another large number of these Israeli men who were taken to Media. Now, Media is right over here on, on the east of Assyria, so underneath my picture here. And Media were a part of the, in league with Assyria in, in a big part of their armies. Media was known for their horses and their mounted cavalry. And they were a big part of the army of Assyria. And so a lot of these Israeli men were brought over into Media, which is just south of the Caspian Sea. Okay, so we, we need to understand what, what was done as, as Israel was taken into captivity. The Assyrian government uh, never intended for these men to come back, and God has never to this very day allowed the people of the ten northern tribes of Israel, these, these families, to reunite and let the people return to their land. Thus was the end of those northern twelve tribes of Israel. As, as they were known in those days, that was the end because they, these men, the Assyrians allowed Assyrian men and probably some men from Media, Medo Persia or Media, Media to come back into the land of Israel to occupy their farmlands, to take their homes, and even take their wives. So that the people that were produced were no longer Israelis no longer descended from Jacob. And that's the reason when we come to the time of Jesus, 700 years after this, they called the people from this area Samaritans, okay, which is named after Samaria, their capital city at the time. But they were no longer considered people of Israel by the people of Jesus' day. Although they claimed to be, uh, they were not descended from, from Jacob any longer. Okay, so let's go on down and let's see, look at, take a look at a passage in Deuteronomy. Here, God had promised through Moses 700 years before the, the Assyrian takeover, God had said to the people of Israel these words. When you beget children and grandchildren and have grown old in the land and act corruptly and take a carved image in the form of anything and do evil in the sight of the Lord your God to provoke him to anger, I call heaven and earth to witness against you this day that you will soon utterly perish from the land which you cross over the Jordan to possess. You will not prolong your days in it, but will be utterly destroyed. And the Lord will scatter you among the peoples, and you will be left few in number among the nations where the Lord will drive you. And he was, he was, we see this 700 years later. We see this prophecy fulfilled precisely the way God said it would happen. And to this very day, none of the northern ten tribes of Israel have been allowed by God to return to their land, the land across the Jordan, the promised land that God had given them. This is so important for us to see that God keeps his promises that are written in his word, the scriptures. You need to keep that principle in mind today and every day in the future, that everything that God says will become true. Come down to verses 7 and 8. 
For so it was that the children of Israel had sinned against the Lord their God, who had brought them up out of the land of Egypt from under the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and they had feared other gods. And had walked in the statutes of the nations whom the Lord had cast out from before the children of Israel and of the kings of Israel, which they had made. The writer of Second Kings placed the blame for this defeat and the captivity exactly where it belonged, on the children of Israel who had sinned against the Lord their God. The ten northern tribes of Israel had abandoned God and consequently received God's promised judgment against their sins. The text cites two general sins of which the people of the northern ten tribes were guilty. Number one, look at this. They walked in the statutes of the nations whom the Lord had cast out from before the children of Israel. God had told the people of Israel through Moses that when they entered Canaan, the land God had promised them, they were not to adopt the practices of the land's inhabitants. We see that in Deuteronomy 12, verses 2 and 3. Instead, God's people accommodated many of the Canaanite pagan customs and eventually became just like them. Indeed, the Canaanites' abominable practices were the reason God had driven the Canaanites from their land. We see that in Leviticus 18, 24 through 30. Now, the second sin we see is that the people of the northern kingdom were led astray by the kings of Israel and, this, and their statues, which the kings had made. Okay. As soon as the kingdom of Israel divided into northern and southern kingdoms, Jeroboam, Israel's very first king, took steps to ensure Israel and Judah remained distinct in every way. We see this described in 1 Kings chapter 12, 26 through 30. Jeroboam placed golden calves in Dan and Bethel and instructed the people to worship there instead of going to the temple at Jerusalem where the Lord God, Yahweh, was worshipped. In 2 Kings 12, 31 and 32, Jeroboam also changed a festival date. We're not told which one. Saw so speculation on, on which one they mean. Uh, probably the, the Day of Atonement, the Fall Festival, and he appointed priests who did not come from the tribe of Levi through Aaron, who were the only ones authorized to accept sacrifices and perform sacrifices to the Lord God of Israel. Jeroboam's successors followed his example and led their people even further astray from the Lord God. Examples, you can go look these up. 1 Kings chapters 16, 22, and in 2 Kings chapters 10, 13, and 15. Now let's come down to verses 9 and 10 in our text. Also the children of Israel secretly did against the Lord their God things which were not right. And they built for themselves high places in all their cities, from the watchtower to fortified city. They set up for themselves sacred pillars and wooden images on every hill and under every green tree. Now let's look at this text just a little bit. Also, the children of Israel secretly did against the Lord their God things that were not right. They, they adopted evil practices that dishonored him, but of course they could not hide their evil from the Lord their God. They also built for themselves high places 
in all of their cities. And it goes on and emphasizes a couple of things there. The term high places refers to elevated spots on which the Canaanites, whom God had driven out of the land before them, had worshipped their in their their deities, their pagan deities, Baal and Asherah, on these high places. Okay. God in, had instructed all the people of Israel through Moses in Deuteronomy 12, 13 through 14, not to worship in such places, but only in the place the Lord would choose when they entered their land. First, that was the place of the tabernacle that they were carrying through the wilderness. But then after the tabernacle got worn out, it was just a tent, Solomon built a great, a great structure modeled after the tabernacle, and that was the new place that God had select, selected for the people of Israel to worship. In 1 Kings 15, 14, and in 1 Kings 22, 43, we read that even after Solomon completed the temple, many people continued to worship on the high places. It was much more convenient for them. They, they didn't have to walk all the way to Jerusalem to worship. Okay, so they had, they had a high place on their own property and they'd worship there. Uh, now, some may have been worshiping the Lord on their high places, but they were doing so in a manner which he prohibited. It was the manner in which the Canaanites would worship. And God had specified in the tabernacle the acceptable manner that he wished to be worshipped. People establish these high places to worship virtually everywhere. Whether a settlement was small enough to simply have a watchtower. Now, watchtower is just a, a high tower that they built that people stood up in so that they could see across the the hilly terrain further out on the horizon to see if there was a, an army, an invading army coming on their town. So they had time to, to try to do something. Or even they built these places in their, even their fully fortified cities, which is speaking of walled cities like Samaria. In verse 10, let's look at verse 10 here. The people of the 10 northern tribes set up for themselves sacred pillars and Asherah poles. That's how it's translated in the Christian Standard Bible. Archaeologists have uncovered many of these sacred pillars and Asherah poles from the per this period of Israel's history. There are tells all over Israel today, and these are those archaeological sites. And they found many of these buried at about that historical time frame. The sacred pillars were most often stacks of large stones. The practice of using stacks of stones as a place of worship goes all the way back to the time of the patriarchs of Israel. For examples, in Genesis 28, 18 and 35, 14, Jacob, the patriarch whom God named Israel, who was the father of the patriarchs of each one of the 12 tribes of Israel, Jacob worshiped God by the use of a pillar because there was no tabernacle yet set up by God. God later prohibited the practice when the people settled in the land of Israel along with the tabernacle that God had given them during the Exodus. The sacred pillars most often bore the image of a god. We have found many of these images, also of Baal, in the same tells where they find the tells the images, the Asherah poles, Baal, ba these images of Baal portray him generally as sitting on the back of a bull, riding a bull, 
and holding lightning bolts in his hands. He was the sun god okay, of the Canaanites. The Asherah poles resemble what we in the USA and in Polynesia would call totem poles or tikis. The Asherah poles evac excavated in Israel are the image of a naked woman carved in a tree trunk or a pole. Asherah was, a, was the goddess of fertility and the female cohort of the sun god Baal. Worship of Asherah often involves sexual rites that the written law of God prohibited. Book of Judges describes how the Israelites constantly fell into sin, forsaking the Lord and worshiping Baal and Asherah instead. We see this in Judges 3, 6, and other places as well, down through that about 200-year history recorded in Judges. Israel, the so-called people of God, had established these pagan worship practices on every high hill and under every green tree. Now let's go to, as we see there in verse 10, okay, let's go to verses 11 and 12 now. There. Speaking, speaking of on the high places, they burned incense on all the high places, just like it says, <laughs> like the nations whom the Lord had carried away before them. And they did wicked things to provoke the Lord to anger, for they served idols of which the Lord had said to them, you shall not do this thing. The people of Israel also burned incense on their high places. Now, they worshiped God in places and in manners that God had not prescribed and in many cases were prohibited specifically by God. The law of God in Exodus 30, 34 through 38 stipulated that sacred incense was to be burnt in the tabernacle and temple. But that was... That was the only place where sacred incense could be burnt. The priests were only to use a certain prescribed mixture of ingredients, ingredients in this incense. And this prescribed mixture could be used nowhere else, only in the temple. Okay. Also, the law of God specified that this incense was to burn only in the temple holy place where the person standing there was already, had, has already placed his faith in the shed blood of the sacrificial offering at the altar before he was allowed to come into the holy place. And this person was living a daily walk with the Lord, a faith walk with the Lord, which is what is modeled by the furniture in the holy place. We, we don't have time for that specifically now. This incense in the holy place represented the prayers of the faith-filled saints of God, offering up prayers daily to God and receiving forgiveness as those prayers symbolized by the incense wafted through the the wall, the curtain celebrating, I'm sorry, the curtain separating the holy place from the holy of holies, which is the presence of God. See the symbolism. You could only do that if you had already placed your faith in the sacrifice, the blood sacrifice for sin. The people of Israel were not to burn incense to God or to other gods as acts of private worship. When pe the people of Israel did this, they were doing like the nations whom the Lord had carried away before them. Today's world is in many ways little different from ancient Israel. Believers face numerous temptations to compromise and to adopt the world's practices. 
practices the Bible says we should always avoid as believers in Jesus Christ. Verse 12 of our text, the people, it says that the people served idols alongside their worship of God. The text has already mentioned Asherah, and we know Baal worship was common in the northern ten tribes. The Lord's strong prohibition to his people, he said, you shall not do this thing, follows the pattern of the wording of the Ten Commandments. As in these things, in serving God and worshiping idols in the same places where they worship God violated the first and the second commandments in the Ten Commandments. Now let's come down to verse 13. Yet the Lord testified against Israel and against Judah by all of his prophets, every seer saying, look, turn from your evil ways and keep my commandments and my statutes according to all the law which I commanded your fathers, and which I sent to you by my servants, the prophets. God saw his people straying into idolatry and immorality. And the Lord testified against Israel and against Judah. The Lord warned against Israel and against Judah by all his prophets and every seer. Now, the word prophet is probably more familiar to us than seer. They, these words were used almost interchangeably. We see it, we see it in 1 Samuel 9.9, 9, for example. God called these individuals, both prophets and seers, to bring his message of his, to his wayward people to tell them what they were doing wrong and what God wanted them to do to straighten out their lives. The message his prophets and every seer brought was straightforward. Turn from your evil ways and keep my commandments and my statutes. Likewise today, in order to experience God's salvation, a person needs to only turn from or repent of his or her sinful actions and thoughts, our evil ways, and believe in the perfect and final sacrifice for human sins. As specified in God's scriptures, in and through the Savior, the Son of God, Jesus, the Christ. The Lord tells his people then as well as today to live according to all the law which I've commanded your fathers and which I sent to you by my servants, the prophets. God has displayed his faithfulness to his people over many generations. He rescued us from bondage in Egypt and the people of Israel from bondage in Egypt. And he established his covenant with them, just as he established his new covenant with us through his son, Jesus Christ. He gave his laws and his statutes so that they and we should know how to live. Jesus Christ, under the new covenant scriptures, the New Testament, he has told us how he expects us to live. When we make him Lord, he, tell, he has told us in Scripture, live this way, do these things, and walk away from other things that are sinful. Okay. When the people of Israel turned away from him, God graciously sent prophets to awaken repentance in them and to turn them back to him, just as God tells us through people who teach his word and preach his word, we see the things that God wants us to get rid of in our lives and the things that he wants us to turn to in their place. In Galatians 4, 4 through 5, let's just read some of these things. 
Paul is talking about the Old Testament law and how it applies even in New Testament times. He says, but when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law. Okay, he was a man. He needed to follow these definitions of righteousness that are written in God's law, just as we are. Born under the law to redeem those who are under the law that we might receive the adoption as sons. Jesus is the only human who has ever come to this earth who has not sinned. Every single one of us is sinners, and by that sin we have inherited death. Eternal separation from God. Okay? And Jesus came and, and did not sin and became the once and perfect sacrifice for human sin such that no other animal sacrifice was necessary. Those animal sacrifices in the Old Covenant were just a picture of, of the one true sacrifice for all humankind that was going to be brought by God's Christ, his son. And in Ephesians 2, 8 through 10, we read that we cannot keep the law in 100%. So we should always strive to keep that standard. We can't keep it 100%. So it tells us that we need to understand that for by grace we have been saved through faith, and that not of ourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. We cannot save ourselves by our good works, but by living in fellowship with God through his Son and through his Holy Spirit, we can know God's will for our lives. We can commune with God on a daily, moment-by-moment -moment basis. And in that cooperative relationship, we become God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. Each one of us has things that God wants, call, wants and calls us to do. These things were prepared by God beforehand. That we should walk individually in these good works. Hey, let's come down to verses 14 and 15 in our text. Nevertheless, Israel would not hear but stiffened their necks like the necks of their fathers who did not believe in the Lord their God. And they rejected his statutes and his covenant that he had made with their fathers and his testimonies which he had testified against them. They followed idols, became idolaters, and went after the nations who were all around them, concerning whom the Lord had charged them that they should not do like them. In verse 14, the Christian Standard Bible says that Israel would not listen to God's word. Instead, they became obstinate. They stood defiantly against the Lord their God and refused to bow their heads in submission. In doing so, they were like their ancestors who did not believe the Lord their God. In Numbers 13, 25 through 14, I'm sorry, Numbers 13, 25 through 14, 10, we read that tragically even the people of Israel who saw all of God's miracles in Egypt still did not believe God could give them the land he had promised them. Disobedience to God's commands generally results in because we do not believe that his ways are truly best for us. God calls on you and on me and every single human being to trust his son Jesus 
in everything in our lives. The means to salvation is to repent of our sins and tell God that we are making Jesus Christ the Lord of our lives. Verse 15, look at verse 15 here. God's obstinate people rejected his statutes and his covenant that he had made with their fathers. God commanded parents to teach their children God's ways at every turn in life. We see that in Deuteronomy chapter 6. Excuse me. Each generation needs to learn from the former generation. This text provides further sad testimony regarding the people of Israel. It says, they followed idols and they became idolaters themselves. Now, it's, a, it's a really interesting the way this verse is structured. That's, that's verse number 15. Look at, look at verse 15. The Hebrew phrasing denotes that following worthless practices makes a person worthless. Okay. The same type of phrasing is used in Ecclesiastes and in Jeremiah. In Ecclesiastes, it says, Vanity of vanities, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities. All is vanity. If we go on trying to live life our way, our sinful, disgusting way before God, it is a life lived in vain. It is worthless to us. In Jeremiah 2, 5, we see, Thus says the Lord, What injustice have your fathers found in me? This is God speaking. That they have gone far from me, have followed idols, and have become idolaters. So we can add the word worthless, just as it is translated in the Christian Standard Bible in verse 15 of our text. When we... God's way is perfectly just. There's no injustice in God and in His ways. And he's at, the Lord is asking there, why have the people of Israel turned and gone far from me and have followed idols? He says, in so doing, they have become worthless idolaters. Their life is lived in vain. What that means is this way of living brings condemnation on us under God's judgment. And when we stand in judgment before Him, we will be judged guilty in our sinfulness. We will not be forgiven of our sin except that we believe in the one true and final sacrifice that he sent to earth in his son, Jesus. Okay? Which is the full, in fulfillment of the old covenant in and through the New Testament covenant. Okay, so let's look at verses 16 and 17. So they left all the commandments of their Lord, their God, and made for themselves a molded image and two calves, and made a wooden image, and worshipped all the host of heaven, and served Baal. And they caused their sons and daughters to pass through the fire, practiced witchcraft, and soothsaying, and sold themselves to do evil in the sight of the Lord, to provoke him to anger. Let's look at these two verses in more detail. Israel left all the commandments of the Lord their God. They walked away from them. And they invented their own standards for living. Number one, they made for themselves a molded image and two calves. Made a wooden image, which is a reference to an Asherah pole. See this 
through in and through their very first king, Jeroboam, in 1 Kings chapter 12. Number two, the people of Israel worshipped all the hosts of heaven. And number two, three, they that that stands cons, that second one stands consistent. Worshiping all the hosts of heaven stands consistent with what we see in Romans chapters 1 and 2 in the New Testament, saying that they worship the creation rather than the creator. Okay, number three, they serve Baal, the chief god of the Canaanites, and husband to the goddess Asherah. We see this come forward in very powerfully in, the, in Ahab, King Ahab and Jezebel in 1 Kings 2, 17, through 2 Kings 9. Israel fell further than this once they had gone this far to embrace idolatry and turn away from God. They fell further into living abominations or being worthless to God. Look at what they did. Number four, they caused their sons and daughters to pass through the fire. They participated in child sacrifice. Unimaginable. Number five, they practiced witchcraft and soothsaying, following Satanism, following the evil one, deliberately following evil instead of following the one true holy living God. Number six, they sold themselves to do evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. This is a deliberate act of sin where they deliberately lived to provoke God's anger. What a scary path to go down. Let's come down to verse is 18 through 20, 18 and 19. Therefore, the Lord was very angry with Israel and removed them from his sight. There was none left but the tribe of Judah alone. Also, Judah did not keep the commandments of the Lord their God, but walked in the statutes of Israel which they made. Now let's look at 18 and 19 for just a moment. It tells us that when Israel fell in 722, when the ten northern tribes were defeated and taken off into captivity in Assyria and in Media, there was only left the tribe of Judah. Even though Judah also was had fallen away from God, they did not keep the commandments of the Lord their God perfectly either. The reason that God had left Judah is because he had promised that there would be one coming who would be born of a woman, okay, as we looked at a while ago in Galatians chapter 3, there would be one coming to born of the seed of a woman who would break the enmity caused between God and man because of our sin. As we go on through, we see this promise made then to Abraham in Genesis 22, where after Abraham showed his willingness to sacrifice his own son, just like God was going to sacrifice his son for his sins in a day in the future, God told Abraham that he would bring through his seed this one who would break the enmity between God and man. And then going on in Abraham's offspring in Genesis 49, 9 through 10. From the mouth of Jacob, whom God had renamed Israel, he told his son Judah, who was going to be the patriarch of the tribe of Judah, that 
it would be through his seed that this king of kings would come. Then we come down into Galatians 3, 26 through 4, 7, where the Apostle Paul in the New Testament tells us that Jesus is that one who fulfills all of those prophecies that God gave the people of Israel and that God was faithful and brought through the tribe of Judah this one who would break the enmity between God and man caused by sin. Now let's come down and look at verse 20. And the Lord rejected all the descendants of Israel. Now that means the ten northern tribes, okay, afflicted them and delivered them into the hand of plunderers. And he had cast them from his sight. And this is what we discussed right at the top of the lesson where he gave them over to Assyria. The Assyrians came, took all of their childbearing age men out of the country such that their lineage stopped. But he, so in verse 21 of our text in chapter 17, we see, for the Lord tore Israel from the house of David. Okay. The house of David is the tribe of Judah. David was born of the tribe of Judah. So the Lord tore Israel, the other, the ten northern tribes, away from the house of David. And then he goes on in verse 22 saying, For the children of Israel walked in all the sins of Jeroboam, which he did. They did not depart from them. And the Lord removed Israel out of his sight, as he had said, by all his servants, the prophets. So Israel was carried away from their own land to Assyria as it is to this day. And that goes on to today as well. God has not allowed those 10 tribes of northern Israel to ever return to their land. That's the reason the people that live in the land of Israel today are called Jews. They are Judeans, born of the tribe of Judah. Now we come down to verse 34. To this day, they continue practicing the former rituals. They did not fear the Lord, nor do they follow their statutes or their ordinances or the law and commandment which the Lord had commanded the children of Israel whom he, the children of Jacob whom he named Israel. God named Jacob Israel because all 12 tribes are going to come from his descendants. Let's close now with a word of prayer. Father, we, we praise your holy name. Lord, we we hear this story and it and it and it strikes to our hearts. Because, Lord, we know that it applies to even us today who, who have placed our faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, that, that you expect us. We are people of faith in you, Lord Jesus, to keep your commandments and to live, your, live our lives your way. Lord, we, we commit ourselves to making you Lord of our lives. Lord, we... We see our nation that was built on the principle of faith in you and blessed by you, Lord, as a result in, in ways that no other nation on this earth has ever been blessed. Lord, we know that our nation has turned away from you in many, many ways. No, no longer following your commandments, no longer living your way, uh, no longer trusting in your son as our Lord and our King and our Master. Lord, we, we pray for our nation. We pray for our next-door neighbor. We, we, we pray for our families. We ask, Lord God, that you would speak to the hearts of each one of us. That you would show us your will. You would show us the things that you would have us change in our lives. 
And if we would only repent and turn from our sinful ways and make your Son, Jesus, Lord, that you would bless us again, that you would forgive us of our sins, and you would give us blessing one more time like we had before. Lord, we know the truth, your written truth, will set us free. Lord, we ask that your will be done. We individually ask that you would show us the ways that you would have us to go as your people. Lord, help us to take the good news of your son Jesus to the world. It's in, Lord Jesus, it's in your great name that we ask these things today. Amen. Well, it's good to see each and every one of you here this morning. And I hope to see you next week, uh, same time and same place. Bye-bye.